the Black Dahlia murder. On January 15, 1947, the remains of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short, a.k.a. the Black Dahlia, were found on the block of 3800 South Norton Avenue in Los Angeles. The body was cut in half and so pale and drained of blood that the woman who found the body mistook it for a mannequin. The body was cut with surgical precision, leaving no trauma to internal organs and bones. Her face was also cut from mouth to ears, leaving a disturbing permanent smile. No blood on the ground, making it believed that the body was moved after she had been executed. Nine days after she was found, an envelope was sent to the examiner addressed by using individual cut and pasted letters from magazines and newspapers. It read, The Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers. Here is Dahlia's belongings. Letter to follow. As promised, the envelope contained short social security card, birth certificate, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with pages missing and the name Mark Hansen stamped on the cover. Gasoline was used to clean the objects, removing the fingerprints. On March 14th, a suicide note was found tucked in a shoe in a pile of men's clothing by the ocean's edge at the foot of Breeze Avenue in Venice. The note read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. The pile of clothing was first seen by the beach caretaker, who reported the discovery to the lifeguard captain, John Dillon. Dillon immediately notified the West Los Angeles police station. The clothes included a coat and trousers of blue herringbone tweed, a brown and white shirt, white jockey shorts, tan socks, and tan moccasin shoes about size eight. However, the clothes gave no clue about the identity of their owner. Although many suspects were named, no authorities were able to identify the Black Dahlia's killer, and the mystery has gone unsolved for over 70 years. The Disappearance of Walter Collins On Saturday, March 10, 1928, a nine-year-old by the name of Walter Collins had asked his mother, Christine Collins, to have some money for a movie at the cinema in the neighborhood of Los Angeles. His mother had given him a dime, and he went on his way not knowing that would be the last time she would see her son. When Walter never returned home, his mother, a telephone operator, reported him missing five days later on March 15th. At that time, the city was still shocked from the news of a deceased 12-year-old girl, Marion Parker. It happened three months prior to Walter's disappearance. Tips have been made of allegedly spotting Walter as far as Oakland and San Francisco. In a particular tip, it was stated that Walter was seen at a gas station in Glendale. He was to be seen to have newspaper wrapped around his body where his head was the only part visible. For months, police searched, but still no success in finding Walter. Until August, police picked up a runaway boy who matched Walter's description. The runaway child had informed authorities that he was Walter Collins, the missing boy. He had given them a vague account about his kidnapping. He had spoken to Christine over the phone. Christine paid $70 to bring her son back home to her in Los Angeles. After spending three weeks with the boy, Christine began to realize that the boy was not her son. She had started to speculate that the boy was an inch shorter than Walter and used dental records to prove it wasn't her son. Christine told authorities that in ways the boy did act like her son, but was not certain about it. Walter was quiet and well-behaved, unlike the boy, as he was hard to handle at times. She had also mentioned her son, Walter, addressed her as mother and not ma, like the boy. Although she did hope the boy was her son, but just couldn't bring herself to believe it. Due to the public pressure, the police were insistent that he, in fact, was her son. They even went to lengths as far as having the boy find his way back home by memory, and had even brought in Walter's dog who had recognized the boy as his owner. Yet Christine was still not convinced. Allegedly, LAPD Captain J.J. Jones had made some disheartening remarks to Walter's mother, stating, what are you trying to do? Make fools out of us. Are you trying to neglect your duty as a mother and have the state provide for your son? You are the most cruel-hearted woman I have ever known. 
you are a fool. Christine was then forcibly placed in a psychiatric ward at the Los Angeles County General Hospital on September 8th. J.J. Jones had spoken to the boy again while Christine remained in the psychiatric ward. During that conversation, the boy then confessed to J.J. Jones that he was not the missing boy Walter Collins, but that his real name is Arthur Hutchins. After his mother had passed, the boy ran away from his father and stepmother. He had been hitchhiking around the country until someone in an Illinois cafe had told him he resembled the missing boy from Los Angeles. When he was picked up, authorities were skeptical about his story, but were desperate to close the case that they insisted he was Walter Collins. The reason for the 12-year-old, Arthur, to lie was to meet an actor by the name of Tom Mix in Hollywood. On September 13th, Christine was then released from the psychiatric ward and had sued the LAPD for the abuse she suffered under his custody. Since then, J.J. Jones was suspended from duty and was ordered to pay Christine 10800 However, J.J. Jones failed to do so. In the meantime, Walter Collins was still missing. As time went by, there were theories as to what may have happened to Walter. One being that Walter's father, Walter J. Collins believed his former inmates may have abducted him for revenge. He was serving time in Folsom Prison for robbery. He was working at the prison cafeteria and part of his responsibilities included reporting the violations of other inmates in which he may have gained enemies because of it. Another theory was that Walter Collins was kidnapped by Gordon Stewart Northcott, who may have taken his life at Northcott's chicken farm. Days after Christine's release from the psychiatric ward, immigration officers were closing in on a three-acre chicken farm in Wineville, California. Authorities received a tip about an illegal worker who was smuggled into the country from Canada. After, Gordon convinced his father to buy him the land. He claimed that he needed help running it. He went to Canada to visit his sister Winifred in Saskatoon. He spoke with his sister about letting him take her 14-year-old son Sanford Clark with him back to California. Gordon then began to physically, emotionally, and sexually abuse Sanford. This was the beginning of the horrible acts Gordon Northcott would commit against young boys. Gordon had a pattern of abducting and taking away the lives of boys by using quicklime to dissolve their bodies. In August of 1928, Sanford's 19-year-old sister, Jessie Clark, came to visit him on the farm. Sanford then recounted everything that had transpired there. Jesse informed their mother and contacted the American Council, telling them that Sanford had been smuggled into the country from Canada. When investigators arrived at the chicken farm, Gordon, along with his mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, had fled. Police had made some discoveries which included blood-soaked ground, bodily remains around the ranch, and Sanford was safely taken into police custody. Items belonging to missing boys were discovered on the property. Those items included Boy Scout badges, library books, and letters written to their parents. Two brothers, Nelson and Louis Winslow, only 10 and 12 years of age from Pomona, as well as a Mexican boy named Alvin Gothia, were among those victims whose items or remains were found. On September 15th, Sanford told authorities his account. Police then showed Sanford 30 photos hoping he would identify other victims. One that he positively identified was Walter Collins. On September 20th, in Calgary, Canada, both Gordon and his mother were incarcerated and sent back to the U.S. to stand trial. Gordon confessed that he murdered nine young boys and was only charged for three of the deaths. There wasn't enough evidence to be charged with the death of Walter Collins. As Gordon awaited execution, he had sent a telegram to Walter's mother. Christine. If she came to see him in prison, he would tell her the truth, the day before his execution. Christine showed up to San Quentin, but Gordon retracted and said he didn't want to see her. He didn't know anything about it. He was innocent. Gordon, a pathological liar, left notes around in his cell, stating he never met Walter Collins. He accused of his own father having to have done the heinous crime. It was almost impractical to believe what was true and what was falsified. However, Gordon met his fate on October 2, 1930. 
Although Gordon wasn't charged for the murder of Walter Collins, his mother, Sarah, spent the rest of her days in prison after declaring to have murdered Walter with an axe and burying him in a chicken coop. The dishonor and shame were so bad from what happened in the town of Wineville that the town had renamed itself Mira Loma in 1930. As for Christine, she spent the next 36 years searching for her beloved son until she passed away on December 8, 1964, at the age of 75. David Glenn Lewis In Amarillo, Texas, on January 28, 1993, a man by the name of David Glenn Lewis left his law firm, stating that he felt unwell. Later on, that same day he used one of his credit cards to purchase gasoline. Although feeling unwell, Lewis continued to teach his class at the college until 10 o'clock that night, which happened to be the last time anyone had seen him in Amarillo. The next day, both his wife and daughter had decided to head to Dallas for a shopping trip, unknowingly that this was going to be the last time they'll ever see him alive again. A church member that attended the same church as the Lewises reported that they had seen David rushing through the terminal at Southwest Airlines at Amarillo International Airport. He didn't have any luggage with him either. That same evening is when both his wife and daughter returned home to find that there was no sight of David. The VCR in the living room was apparently still recording the Super Bowl that day of the Dallas Cowboys versus the Buffalo Bills, indicating that Lewis had been watching the game before his disappearance. On the kitchen counter appeared to be his wedding ring and watch, along with two sandwiches in the refrigerator. In both Amarillo and Washington State, the investigation into David Glenn Lewis's disappearance started. In Amarillo, police discovered his red Ford Explorer parked outside the Potter County Courthouse on various occasions. Inside his vehicle, they found his belongings, keys, checkbook, driver's license, and gas station credit cards. After an examination into his financial activity, odd discoveries were made such as a $5,000 deposit into his bank account and plane tickets purchased in his name. These discoveries raised questions about his intentions and if he had already had a plan in place to leave the area willingly. There were speculations on his disappearance that as he worked as a judge and lawyer, he could have made enemies who wanted to harm him since he had received death threats in his time. However, there was no definitive evidence to prove those speculations to be true. In Washington State, on State Route 24 near Moxie, there was an ongoing investigation on an unidentified man known as a John Doe, who had been deceased from a hit-and-run accident. The lack of evidence in efforts to identify the unknown man led authorities to question the possibility of it being David Glenn Lewis. Eventually, a Washington State Patrol detective by the name of Pat Ditter began searching for missing men who fit the physical description of John Doe with the possibility of using Google to help the investigation. This search led Ditter to consider David Glenn Lewis as John Doe. Ditter's suspicion grew of David Glenn Lewis being John Doe when photographs of both David and the deceased man were compared. In the pockets of the clothing John Doe was wearing when he was discovered was Lewis's distinctive glasses. Ditter reached out to the Amarillo police, and after DNA testing, it revealed that David Glenn Lewis was indeed John Doe. The case was finally resolved, and Lewis was reburied closer to home. While John Doe was identified as David Glenn Lewis, providing some closure, there were some raised questions as to how he ended up in Yakima, Washington. What was he doing there? There were no direct flights from Amarillo to Yakima, Washington. So to drive there, it would have taken approximately 24 hours. His family was unaware of any connections he had there, if any, making it more difficult to comprehend his presence being there. The family believes that his disappearance was due to an abduction. The mysterious case of David Glenn Lewis leaves many unanswered questions and heightens confusion to how this ended in tragedy. What are your thoughts on his disappearance? Did he go willingly to Washington? Was he abducted? Let us know your thoughts.